Hi everyone, welcome to today's video where we're finally going to get a chance to see what fumarate hydratase does inside the human body. Specifically, we're going to look at its small but crucial role in cellular metabolism, or more simply, how cells produce and utilize energy to sustain life. But before we can jump right in and see exactly what FH does, we're going to have to talk more broadly about what we mean when we talk about cellular energy. And to do that, we're going to have to start introducing concepts of biochemistry, or how atoms, molecules, and chemical bonds are utilized by living cells. So let's jump right into it and reintroduce ourselves to our cell. And here we can see our mitochondria. And this is that organelle that's responsible for producing the majority of the energy our cells are going to use. The specific molecule that it produces is known as ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. And the great thing about ATP is it's going to act like a battery where we can store potential energy and use it at specific times for specific functions. Some examples of what we might use ATP for are things like muscular contractions, nerve impulses, or even transporting molecules around cells. Basically, ATP is the go-to molecule to do work inside of a cell. And you'll often see it described as the universal unit of energy for cells. And what this means is every cell that we know, whether it's single cell or multicellular organisms like us, is going to use ATP as its source for energy. So then let's take a closer look at the chemical structure of ATP. And the triphosphate is in reference to these three phosphate groups at the tail end of a adenosine molecule. And if you remember anything about chemistry in high school is that energy is going to be stored in the chemical bonds. And that's what the cell is going to do to get energy out of the ATP. We're going to break off those phosphate bonds. And the way this works is we're going to get a molecule of H2O. It's going to break off this third phosphate bond here. And as that phosphate bonds release, it's going to release a whole lot of energy that our cell is going to then use. Once we break off that phosphate bond, ATP is going to turn into a molecule called ADP, or adenosine diphosphate. Diphosphate meaning we only have two phosphate bonds on our molecule now. So when we look at the chemical formula of what just occurred, we started with an ATP molecule, we added an H2O, and the resulting products of that interaction is we're left with an ADP, we have that inorganic phosphate, and we have that energy for the cell to use now. But because cells are constantly working, we need a way to recharge this molecule and turn it back into ATP to utilize it again. And this is where the mitochondria comes in. It has specific cellular machinery that's going to be able to rejoin this inorganic phosphate atom back onto ADP to recharge that ATP molecule so that we can use it again. And this cycle is going to continue over and over and over. So let's zoom in then and see what's going on inside that mitochondria that's allowing this process to occur. Here then we can see the inside of our mitochondria, and let's orient ourselves to what we're looking at. Here in purple is what's known as the mitochondrial matrix, or the inner portion of the mitochondria. In blue, this is known as our inner membrane. In tan, this outer portion is known as the outer membrane, and the space between is the inner membrane space. And what's important about these membranes is the cell is going to use them as dividing walls or partitions that keep certain substances separated from each other. And this is going to be crucial for how life works because it gives us control of what comes in or goes out of our environment. So now that we have the basic layout of the mitochondria, we can introduce the first structure associated with this energy production, and that's going to be ATP synthase. And it's ATP synthase's job to be that recharging station for ATP. So the way ATP synthase works is once we want to recharge ADP, it's going to come back into the mitochondria and attach itself to ATP synthase. And the ATP synthase is going to spin like a turbine, and as it spins, it's going to add on that phosphate molecule to ADP and recharge it back to ATP. The question is then, what makes this turbine spin? So one way to describe how ATP synthase works is to kind of compare it to a hydroelectric dam, where if we store a bunch of water on one side of the dam and then open up the gates to the turbine, the water is going to rush through it and spin that turbine, and we're going to take energy from that process. But instead of water to spin our turbine, we're going to use a high concentration of hydrogen ions on one side of the dam. And if we create an opening in this inner membrane space, these hydrogen ions are going to naturally want to move through that opening. And as they move through it, they're going to power this turbine, adding that phosphate molecule to the ATP and thus recharging the battery. So another thing to notice then is on these hydrogen ions, you'll notice this plus sign. And what this plus sign is showing is that there's a positive electrical charge associated with these hydrogen ions. And so whenever you have movement of a charged particle, there's going to be an electrical current that flows with it. 
So as these hydrogen ions are moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration, they're carrying that electrical charge, and that electrical charge is what ATP synthase uses to power this process. So the next problem we have to solve is how do we collect and concentrate all these hydrogen ions inside that intermembrane space? To show how we do this, we're gonna to have to add more structures to the picture. What we've added here then is what's known as the electron transport chain. And as you can see, this electron transport chain has multiple components to it, and we're gonna to refer to these as complexes. So we're using Roman numerals where this is complex one, complex two, complex three, and complex four. And you'll notice that we have openings within this membrane which are gonna allow these structures to move hydrogen ions from the mitochondrial matrix into that inner membrane space. But in order to do this, we're gonna need a supply of energy. But obviously, we don't wanna use ATP as that source of energy because then we wouldn't have a net gain of ATP in the final product. And this is where the Krebs cycle comes into the picture. It's the Krebs cycle's job to produce these energy-rich molecules that are gonna power these proton pumps that move the hydrogen ions from the mitochondrial matrix into the inner membrane space. Now that we've introduced all the players involved, let's run through the process and see exactly what's going on. So the first step is gonna involve this high energy NADH molecule interacting at complex one. After this interaction, we're gonna take away a hydrogen atom from NADH as well as two negatively charged electrons. And as these negatively charged electrons pass through complex one, we're gonna utilize that negative charge to draw the hydrogen from that mitochondrial matrix into the inner membrane space. From there, we're gonna transport the electrons to complex three, where again, we're utilizing that negative charge to bring another hydrogen ion through. At the same time, this FADH2 molecule is gonna to start to interact at complex two, we're gonna take two hydrogen ions off of that as well as two more electrons. But you'll notice there's no passageway to bring the hydrogen ions through. So to make use of these electrons, this coenzyme Q is gonna pick up these electrons as well, bring them over to complex three. And just like before, once they're at complex three, we're gonna bring the hydrogen ion through. We're gonna transport the electrons again. Here they're joined onto cytochrome C, where we bring them to complex four. And complex four will use that energy to bring the remaining hydrogen ions to the inner membrane space. And now you can see we've created that high concentration of hydrogen ions. We've put that water behind the dam. We're ready to let it through the turbine to spin ATP synthase and recharge ATP. Now, because cells are constantly going through this energy process, we need a way to reset the system. So we have to do something with these electrons in complex four. We have to get rid of them to make room for new electrons. And this is the job of oxygen. The oxygen we breathe is gonna act as the final electron acceptor in this electron transport chain. So the electrons will attach to the oxygen. The oxygen will then go around and interact with these free hydrogen ions. And the final product of this entire situation is gonna be a molecule of H2O. Because this process has to keep running over and over and over, we're gonna to have to recharge this NAD plus molecule and this FAD molecule. So they're gonna head back to the Krebs cycle where the chemical processes there are gonna recharge. We now have our NADH and FADH2 again. They're gonna go back to complex one and complex two. And we're gonna transport more electrons, bring more hydrogen ions over and keep spinning that turbine. To sum up everything so far, the food we eat, in this case, we'll use glucose as an example. We're gonna use these high energy bonds in the carbon, hydrogens, and oxygens to fuel the Krebs cycle and generate more NADH and FADH2 molecules to feed into the electron transport chain. Along with that, the oxygen we breathe is gonna accept those electrons. So they're gonna to go to the respective areas where the glucose in the Krebs cycle will generate CO2 that we breathe out. The oxygen will combine with those hydrogen ions and form H2O. And all told, we'll get a high yield of ATP. We're gonna produce a whole lot of energy through this process. And that process is known as oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative is just in reference to the chemical reactions that are releasing high energy electrons and phosphorylations in reference to the phosphate atom being put back onto ADP to create the final ATP for our cells to use. Here then we can see an overview of the Krebs cycle, which is also called the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle. And what we're looking at here is a series of chemical reactions that are gonna produce those electron rich NADH and FADH2 molecules and the CO2 that we breathe out. But before we can look specifically at what's going on in each of these steps, we need to zoom back out and see how our body is taking the food we eat and putting it into our cells. 
The first step then after we break down carbohydrates and the glucose is brought into our cells is going to be a process known as glycolysis. This 10 step process where we take this large glucose molecule and we break it down into a more manageably sized smaller molecules that can then enter into the mitochondria. But because this isn't the focus of the video, we're going to kind of skip through a lot of these steps. But there's two main portions of glycolysis. There's going to be the energy investment phase where we're going to take molecules of ATP and we're going to take off those phosphates, add them onto the glucose. From there, we're going to get this larger molecule that we're going to split into two separate molecules. And from there, we're going to produce the final product of two molecules of pyruvate. And we're going to gain four ATPs and two NADHs. So we will get a net return on our energy, but this isn't going to be nearly as much as oxidative phosphorylation. From here then, and so long as there's oxygen present, these pyruvate molecules can now enter into the mitochondria where they'll complete the final steps before they enter into the Krebs cycle. Zooming into the mitochondria, we can now see our pyruvate has been shuttled into the mitochondrial matrix. From here, it's gonna interact with a complex of enzymes known as pyruvate dehydrogenase. Specifically, there's gonna be three enzymes titled E1, E2, and E3. And as we'll see, as pyruvate passes through this complex of enzymes, we're going to change the chemical structure. We're going to take off some CO2. We're going to add a CoA group and we're going to generate an NADH, which can go to the electron transport chain. But the important part is, is we're left with this molecule called acetyl-CoA. And the important thing about acetyl-CoA, this is the molecule that can enter into the Krebs cycle. And along with glucose being able to be transformed into acetyl-CoA, we can also form acetyl-CoA from proteins and fats we get from our diet. So you can think of acetyl-CoA as the linchpin from the food we eat to the energy we create in our mitochondria. Here then we're ready for acetyl-CoA to finally enter into the Krebs cycle. Once we enter into the Krebs cycle, acetyl-CoA is gonna interact with oxaloacetate and in the presence of an enzyme known as citrate synthase, we're gonna combine all these atoms together and form this large molecule known as citrate. Citrate will then continue through the Krebs cycle, hence the name citric acid cycle, from here, citrate's going to interact with an enzyme called econotase. I should point out, when we talk about enzymes, these are structures designed to speed up and optimize chemical reactions. In the case of econotase, it's going to shuffle around a couple atoms and turn it into a molecule called isocitrate. From here, isocitrate is going to continue on and meet up with another enzyme called isocitrate dehydrogenase. We just saw dehydrogenase in the previous complex. But the job of a dehydrogenase enzyme is to steal hydrogen atoms off a molecule. And in this case, we want to put them on this NAD plus molecule. As we add the hydrogens to NAD plus, we've created an electron rich molecule. And along with that, we've taken off some carbon and oxygen and formed a CO2, which we're going to breathe out. So we'll put these two over into our Krebs cycle products. And after all that chemical shuffling, we're left with a molecule called alpha ketoglutarate. This will continue on and interact with alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Again, we're stealing hydrogen atoms off, put it on to NAD+, create another energy-rich molecule, produce some more CO2 that we're going to breathe out. And we've also added this CoA group to the end, creating a molecule called succinyl-CoA. Succinyl-CoA is going to continue along and interact with an enzyme called succinyl-CoA synthase. And the job of this enzyme is to turn this CoA group into GDP, which is eventually going to be turned into ATP. So we get a little bit of usable ATP out of the Krebs cycle as well. After these reactions are complete, we're now going to have a molecule called succinate. Succinate then is going to continue on, and here it's going to interact with an enzyme called succinate dehydrogenase. We're going to steal a couple more hydrogens from succinate, add them to FAD to turn that into FADH2, that electron-rich molecule that interacted with complex 2. And some of you may notice that the succinate dehydrogenase sounds familiar. And that's because people with mutations in the SDH gene share a similar pathology to HLRCC in that they have a higher risk of certain types of cancers. And this is because they both disrupt the function of the Krebs cycle, which paves the way for tumor growth. That being said, there are distinct differences between the two pathologies. And this is because the accumulation of succinate and the accumulation of fumarate are going to lead to different downstream effects inside of the cells. But now we can see we turn succinate into the molecule of fumarate. Fumarate continues on, and finally, this is where fumarate hydratase makes its appearance. Here you'll notice that inside the enzyme, we have this H2O molecule, and this is what the word hydratase is in reference to. Hydro meaning water, and the job of FH is to add those two hydrogen and one oxygen atoms to fumarate, and it's going to change that molecule into malate. 
So even though that's a relatively simple hydration reaction, if this doesn't occur, the whole cycle can end up becoming dysfunctional and the whole metabolism system will end up suffering because of it. Continuing on though with our normal functioning Krebs cycle, malate will end up meeting with the enzyme malate dehydrogenase where we'll make another NADH molecule. After this reaction occurs, we're going to end up back at oxaloacetate. So the cycle has now completed itself. Oxaloacetate will continue forward where it's again going to meet up with citrate synthase and another molecule of acetyl-CoA. And you can see the cycle is complete where we're back at citrate and we can continue going forward through the cycle generating all these products that are going to end up at the electron transport chain. So if we look at the final products of one round of the Krebs cycle, we end up with three NADH molecules, we expel two CO2 molecules, we get one ATP and one FADH. So now we see how everything normally works. The question is what happens if any of these enzymes or any of these steps are dysfunctional? And that's what's going to happen in HLRCC. We're going to have this mutated FH enzyme that's not going to be able to hydrate, fumarate, and so it puts a stop or puts a traffic jam in the Krebs cycle where we can't create malate. However, all these upstream reactions are still taking place, and as these continue forward, fumarate is going to start to accumulate. And as it accumulates more and more, it's going to create uh, pathological conditions within that singular cell. And when it gets to a certain level, this danger level up here that leads it down the path to turn into a tumor and in kidney cells, potentially an aggressive malignant renal cancer. But thankfully, because we still have that wild type allele that's able to produce a functioning FH enzyme. We're able to manage this Krebs cycle at least enough to keep it functioning at a sufficient level where the accumulation of fumarate isn't so high that we're at that danger zone where things become pathological. And when you have a situation like this where your remaining good allele is able to sufficiently manage the health of a cell, this is known as haplosufficiency. And what we mean when we say condition is haplosufficient, if you remember, each of our chromosomes is a pair. So this is chromosome one, we have two chromosome ones, and this is why we're known as a diploid organism. The word haploid then is in reference to just one chromosome, or in this case, one allele. So when something's haplosufficient, it means this one allele is able to produce enough enzyme to keep the cell in working condition. However, you can imagine, because we only have one good remaining allele, if anything were to happen to it, our cells would no longer have an instruction to make this proper functioning fumarate hydratase. And this is what happens when the cell suffers a double hit. There's a mutational event in our remaining good allele and we lose the ability to create any functioning FH protein. In this case, we'd end up with all mutated FH enzymes. You'll notice that it doesn't quite look the same as the other mutation because this is a random chance event, and so the mutation won't be exact like the one you were born with, but the end result is that you're not going to have a functional FH enzyme. And when there's no functional FH enzyme, we're going to get that accumulation of fumarate again, and at this point, we're going to reach that danger zone, and it's after this double hit where cells are going to start on their journey to becoming tumors. So before we get to the videos where we talk about the effects of what happens when you have all that fumarate accumulating within a cell, we're going to look a little bit more closely at what happens when we still have that good wild type and that bad FH allele inside our cells, because it's not going to be as simple as a 50-50 split like we see here. It's a little bit more complicated because it's going to come down to the subunits and how they interact with each other. Hopefully this video gave you a better understanding of what's going on at the cellular level in HLRCC and will explain why fumarate hydratase is such an important enzyme because when cellular metabolism goes haywire, the entire cell is going to suffer because of it. Thanks again for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you soon in the next video.